We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. I'm going to be talking about malignant malaria in humans. So uh, malaria is one of the world's leading infectious diseases. Uh, in 2018, there were 228 million cases and about a half a million deaths. Um, so this is actually compared, if you can, if you can compare that to, to the number of COVID-19 cases, um, there's actually quite a bit more, still quite a bit more malaria than there is COVID-19, uh, even though malaria is limited to uh, parts of sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. Human malaria is caused by at least five species of eukaryotic um, apicomplex and parasites, and Plasmodium falciparum malaria is, is the most lethal and what I'll be talking about most this afternoon. Malaria is spread by female anopheline mosquitoes, uh, and the parasites have a very, very life, uh, complex life cycle, um, which I'll briefly uh, describe. So uh, malaria starts by the, when, when you're bitten by a mosquito, which releases hundreds of sporozoites into your bloodstream. Uh, these sporozoites will migrate to your liver and set up a brief in, uh, asymptomatic infection that will last up to 10 days. The symptoms of malaria only start when the parasites exit your liver and begin to replicate in your erythrocytes. Uh, a parasite will invade an erythrocyte, um, it will consume the hemoglobin in your erythrocyte, it will replicate, and then when it's done, it will burst the er erythrocyte and, and releasing about 20 new merozoites, which will then reinvade erythrocytes. This is where you get all the symptoms of malaria, the characteristic fever and chills. In response to cues that we don't entirely understand, some of the uh, parasites will decide that it's time to exit and they will differentiate into male and female gametocytes. And these are the only forms of the parasite that can survive in the midgut of a mosquito. When a mosquito takes a blood meal, the gametocytes will immediately differentiate into male and female gametes. They will mate with one another. Uh, there will be a brief meiosis. The, uh, Resulting parasites will migrate um, out of the midgut of the mosquito, uh, set up an oocyst on the midgut wall, and then eventually uh, uh, they will uh, migrate to the salivary glands where they can start the infection again. Malaria, when you get it, can be very, very nasty. You can have uh, the, the most typical symptoms are a cyclical fever and anemia, uh, but you can also get end organ damage, especially with Plasmodium falciparum. Uh, much of the pathology is associated with a cytokine storm that comes from the high parasite burden in the blood stages. And if you aren't treated, um, and, is, and if you haven't been exposed to malaria before, um, uh, malaria can often be fatal. Death is often from respiratory distress, uh, similar to what you get with COVID-19, and it's caused by brain swelling and pressure on the brain stem. And the reason that you have brain swelling with malaria is because the parasites um, alter the surface of an infected erythrocyte uh, to help with their survival. So um, in addition to, to modifying the erythrocyte so they can eat the hemoglobin in it, they will also send out projections that make the erythrocyte sticky. And these sticky erythrocytes will, will cytoadhere to the capillaries uh, primarily in your brain, and this allows them to avoid clearance in your spleen. Uh, 
The problem with this is that uh, it, it ultimately can uh, um, uh, produce neurological uh, symptoms and brain swelling, which ultimately can lead to death. So um, critical to the pathogenesis of malaria is, is, is the process of antigenic variation. So uh, when we think of viral pathogens, um, often you get them once and then you become immune. And with malaria, and this is the reason we have so many cases, people get infected over and over again. So in some parts of Africa, um, it's very typical that you would have uh, malaria multiple times every year. And this might last you might have symptomatic malaria up until you know you're in your 20s. So you can get infected over and over again. Now what happens is that the parasites uh, in a different in a given geographical area will display a different set of epitopes on the surface of, of the infected cells. And then the parasites uh, can use recombination as well as um, silencing of, of specific gene families to, to change the set of, of antigens that are displayed. So you can uh, generate antibodies to one type of parasite, and then the parasite will decide to switch and make a new form, which will be a minor population, and you'll no longer have antibodies to this. So if you look at um, the, the, the sort of cycle that goes on, you can see waves of parasitemia coming up and then going away again. Another problem is, is that you can become somewhat immune um, through repeated exposure to malaria, and then you can get up and leave for example, came, come to the United States where we don't really have much malaria and then after, uh, go back after 10 years and you can get uh, really sick again. Um, so many of the cases that we see in the United States uh, come from people that, that were exposed to malaria as a child, thought they could handle it, went back to their home country and then discovered that they could no longer handle it. The AT richness of the genome um, actually encourages a lot of, of, of recombination, which is essential to the pathogenesis of the parasite. Um, well, it sounds very uh, dire. Um, malaria can be actually fairly easily treated if you have, um, have drugs. And we have several different drugs that, that work fairly well against malaria parasites. Um, most of them are derived from natural products um, such as artemisinin and quinine. Um, you've probably heard of, of, of taking gin and tonics to, to treat malaria symptoms. And while we have resistance, uh, if you're treated in time, uh, it's most likely you will not uh, probably, you will not die from malaria. Now, an interesting feature about malaria parasites is, is, is that, um, that they can infect many different species. So there's over 170 different plasmodium species, and some of them affect uh, penguins, some of them affect ducks, uh, like coronaviruses. They can also be found in bats and in mice, and there's a gecko, and, and also in gorillas and chimpanzees. Um, and there might be even more plasmodium species than, uh, than uh, documented. It's probable that we just haven't looked hard enough. Now, um, zoonoses, uh, when we jump from one species to the next, tend to be rare with plasmodium. And this is because um, malaria parasites tend to uh, employ specialized and species-specific molecular machineries uh, in order to, that they use to invade red cells. So uh, this is a diagram of the red cell shown in the left, and the little uh, purple thing is, an, is a malaria parasite. And and what they do is they, they, they use specific receptors to dock onto the erythrocyte. And then they, um, they basically squeeze a load of proteins into the erythrocyte membrane, which causes it to deform. And the membrane will deform and then eventually enclose the malaria parasite around itself. And so since different vertebrates have different sets of proteins, and this is a very specific process, a given parasite will typically only infect closely related species. So for example, um, Plasmodium burgii, which is a rodent malaria, will just infect rodents, um, typically just rat and mice. And human malaria, falciparum malaria, can infect chimpanzees, but it really uh, doesn't infect um, other types of monkeys all that well. Um, there's a lot of different receptors that are expressed in the parasite, and they have different ligands. Uh, on the red cells and, and you need to change both in order to get in a, a successful infection. And these are just some of the um, receptors and ligands that have been studied so far for some different species.
So the annual death rate um, from malaria in many African countries is, is actually similar to the death rate from COVID-19 in, in New York. Uh, but the big difference um, is that uh, the death rate in malaria parasites typically happening in pre-reproductive age children. Um, so you can imagine that this has a very big impact on, on the human genome. Um, it's estimated that before modern anti-malarial drugs, more than 20% of the children uh, would have died uh, in their first decade of life uh, from malaria. Um, typically, they would have uh, been exposed to over 700 infectious mosquito bites each year. So um, you can imagine, again, that this would have a big impact on, on the human genome. So with repeated infections and high mortality, selective pressure on the human genome is intense. Um, and there are several different alleles that we know uh, have a major contribution. And one of these is, is the sickle cell allele, or hemoglobin S. So if you have uh, both copies of the sickle cell allele, it's very disadvantageous and you're very sick. If you happen to be a heterozygous uh, for the sickle cell allele, it provides uh, protection from severe malaria and is clearly uh, maintained in African populations because of the protective advantage uh, that, it, um, that it confers. The sickle cell allele is found at high levels in areas where malaria is prevalent. Uh, the exact mechanism by which sickle cell, the sickle, human sickle cell allele provides protection is not that well understood. In addition, there's a variety of other different uh, blood group alleles that uh, are, are alleles of genes, of proteins that are expressed in red cells that are thought to confer protection against malaria. One of them is the Duffy blood group antigen, uh, which has been uh, lost in many Africans, and this provides protection against uh, Plasmodium vivax, which uh, does not infect uh, many African populations. Um, there's also a variety of thassalemias that are found in Mediterranean populations. And it's even thought that the human uh, ABO blood group um, w arose uh, many millions of years ago uh, to provide protection against malaria. Uh, people with the O uh, blood group type uh, tend to uh, get less severe malaria. So um, I'm going to talk recently about one story, and, and there are many stories about the impact of malaria on the human genome and evolution. Uh, one I wanted to just briefly mention is cytidine monophosphate and acetyl neuraminic acid hydrolase, or CMAH. Um, and I want to talk about this one because there might be some other speakers that will be talking about it uh, today. So this encodes the most common form of sialic acid on mammalian cells, or the most common form of sialic acid on mammalian cells are N-acetylneuramic acid and N-glycolylneuramic acid, or NU5GC. So humans express NU5AC but lack NU5GC because of an ALU-mediated exon deletion in the gene encoding cytidine um, monophosphate NU5-AC hydrolase. Which, uh, which performs the conversion. And um, this is found only in humans, uh, and it's not found in some of our nearest um, neighbors, such as, as chimpanzees and gorillas. And expression of CMAH in non-human cells, uh, such as CHO cells, can result in glycosyl glycosylation patterns that, that can trigger immune reactions. In order to, to investigate whether CMAH provides protection against malaria, um, colleagues of mine at the Harvard School of Public Health uh, wanted to test whether they could express CMAH uh, from macaques and make human erythrocytes more susceptible to malaria. So uh, they used a type of malaria parasite here that primarily infects uh, macaques. It's found in Southeast Asia. And it causes a fair amount of disease in, in, in the monkeys. And if, um, if you get bitten by a mosquito that carries Plasmodium nolzii malaria, you can come down with fever and malaria-like symptoms, except the parasite won't replicate uh, for any period of time in your erythrocytes. So if you want to maintain Plasmodium nolzii in, in a culture in the laboratory, you basically have to get macaque blood and you have to get Plasmodium nolzii. And you need the two together in order to get a replication cycle going and, and to get the parasites to, 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 to reproduce themselves. So what Manoj and colleagues wanted to test was to see if, um, if, if you switched out uh, the uh, human CMAH uh, with the uh, uh, version from macaques if you could now get uh, uh, the monkey parasite to replicate in human erythrocytes. So uh, to do this, they took uh, human uh, erythrocyte stem cells, uh, they, they added in the macaque CMAH, uh, 
And then they were able to show that these modified human erythrocytes expressed the protein, uh, sialylated proteins, uh, typical, similar to what you would see on the surface of, of the macaque erythrocyte. And uh, that is shown right here. And even though they didn't do a complete gene replacement, you can see uh, in, the, in panel F that uh, many of the glycoproteins are now sialylated. So then after establishing this model, they wanted to see if you would have increased ability for parasites um, of Plasmodium uh, nolzi species, if they would be able to uh, replicate in human erythrocytes. And in fact, um, if you express C, uh, CMAH from Plasmodium nolzi on human erythrocytes, uh, you do get much better replication um, in, in human erythrocytes. So this uh, provides circumstantial evidence that um, potentially the loss of CMAH at one point in human evolutionary history um, allowed uh, para uh, humans to potentially avoid infection uh, by uh, parasites similar to the monkey parasites that currently infect macaques. This is just one story, however, and there's just a, a sort of a, a, an endless um, list of different hemoglobinopathies that, that may pro provide protection against malaria. Uh, a couple years ago, there was a study that was published in, in Science. The authors showed that there's a Dantu blood type um, that, 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 that's strongly associated with, with protection against malaria. And, and the thing about this is that there's often a lot of switching that goes on. Um, so you have the Dantu uh, blood group present in parts of Africa, and then it, it's most likely that you have specific parasites in this part of Africa that can invade um, erythrocytes with this particular, this particular blood group. And we also know that, that, if you, that many of these uh, receptors are actually non-essential and you can knock one out and then another one will pop up. Um, so it, keeps, it seems that they keep a lot of receptors um, in reserve, uh, and it's essentially an evolutionary arms race where the parasites often changing, the humans often changing, and, and they're both trying to outdo each other over and over again. One of the questions that I have after, that one might have after doing this is, you know, it, it seems to be fairly easy to, to acquire mutations that allow you to escape malaria. And yet malaria continues to have a very big impact on, 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 on human health. Um, again, still huge numbers of cases. And, you know, since it's so difficult to maintain a life cycle, you need to have mosquitoes, you need to have the right receptors, uh, you need to have tropical weather. I mean, how does this persist? And, you know, is there any advantage that, that comes to the human species from having malaria infection? Um, and I actually was scouring the literature and I couldn't really find anything. Um, but if there's no advantage, why, why does it keep, why does it persist? Do parasites possibly drive speciation? Does pressure on blood groups have an evolutionary advantage over, for other diseases? Are infected people possibly fitter in some ways or more attractive in some ways than uninfected ones? I'm not sure we know about that. The other thing that I wanted to bring up, and just to end my talk, is is uh, the uh, the lamp, the lamp, um, the street light effect. And this is an old joke. And uh, there's a policeman, and there's a, a drunk, and he's uh, he's fumbling around under this the, the the street light, and the policeman asks him what he's doing, and the uh, the drunk says, "Oh, I'm looking for my keys." And so they they both look for a few minutes, and, and they can't find anything. And, and the policeman says, "Are you sure?" Uh, you lost your keys here. And he says, no, I left them in the park, except this is the only place I could see to look. And it's important to remember when we study malaria parasites that we often only work with a fairly small number of, of isolates. And it's very difficult to take isolates that you collect out of people into culture, uh, possibly because you need to have the right match between erythrocytes and parasites. And, and the studies that we perform on the one or two different uh, common laboratory strains uh, may not necessarily tell us what is really happening out there in the big wide world. Thank you.